The misconception I want to talk about today has to do with quantum field theory and the Casimir force. It's widely believed that um, the vacuum is full of field fluctuations. And it's believed that this is something which has been experimentally proven. And that these field fluctuations are responsible, amongst other things, for something called the Casimir force. Now, um, that may very well be true. But um, I want to elucidate this a little bit and talk about it a little bit more deeply and talk about what we're actually talking about here. Because when we're talking about the Casimir force, what is the Casimir force? The Casimir force is the, fo is, 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 is the force which would exist if you had a system which consisted of two parallel plates in a vacuum, perfectly conducting, perfectly flat plates, and you began to bring them closer to each other if there existed vacuum fluctuations in space. Now, what those plates would do is they would exclude some of the possible quantum states in the space between them. And that would mean then that there was a force on the outside of the plates, on the other side coming from all of space, on the outside of my two hands here, if these were parallel conducting plates in a vacuum, that was larger than the force on the inside of the two plates, which would hence push them together. And this should be responsible for a force called the Casimir force. Now, why do I think this may not be the whole story? Well, it's one of two things. Uh, in, in fact, what, what, what happened is there's a beautiful experiment carried out where somebody tried, uh, where, where experimenters tried to approximate as closely as possible in a very sensitive experiment of uh, using very smooth gold balls um, in, the, in the initial experiments where they had a look at this force between, uh, between things that were close to one another and they indeed found a force. And that force was consistent with this idea of the Casimir force. So there we have it. We have quantum field theory and we have a measurement. We have an experiment which is consistent with that quantum field theory. So that's it then. Proven. In it. Well, no, it's not. And the reason it's not proven is we have to really think about what we're talking about here. We're talking about two things coming close to one another and there being an attraction between them. What Casimir was trying to explain was something called the van der Waals forces. And the van der Waals forces were known about for a very long time before the experiment that was carried out to prove that the Casimir force existed. And it's the kind of force that's responsible, for example, for holding sticky, the way sticky tape works, the way that materials stick together a little bit. It's not nearly as strong as things like covalent bonding force or an ionic force in terms of chemistry. It's a very weak force. When I learned it at school, we we're talking about fluctuating dipoles on the surface and that they, as they change, they on average tend to attract one another. And this is another theory, if you like, of the van der Waals forces. And there are others. If you look them up, you'll be quite shocked at the number of possibilities here in, 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 in terms of these things. We're talking about a quite, a, quite a weak force. And also, if you think about it, we're talking about a theory and an experiment. But what is the theory? The theory is that we have a couple of perfectly smooth, perfectly conducting parallel plates, and then we have, a, have a, an interaction between them. But what if the plates are not conducting? Should you then still have the force, as in something like sticky tape, for example? Well, the, force, the thing still works with non-conducting surfaces. Secondly, if it were really true that the force that I can feel when my hands stick together a little bit, I should really feel that force on the outside of my hands, shouldn't I? On the outside of these conducting plates. So when I pull my hands apart, I shouldn't feel the stickiness on the inside of those hands, but on the outside, a space pushed a little bit against it. So you have to think, where does this force act from the outside? And if you start thinking yourself down into the nature of the materials which you're thinking about, then it's, it's a difficult thing conceptually. Obviously, the plane isn't on the outside of your hands. It's experimentally, you don't feel it there. Just try it. You won't feel it. It feels on the inside of your hands. So the question is then, where does that force act? Does it act on the last layer of atoms in the surface of this perfectly smooth conducting pair of plates? Where is that force acting on the outside? And the answer, and, and, and the, the answer is very difficult to find. But this is the 21st century. We're in 2020. People do experiments with things called atomic force microscopes. So what is an atomic force microscope? Well, that's a very sharp tip, which you take to the surface of a piece of material. And you make it, if you can, atomically sharp. And you make it vibrate a little bit. And what happens is you bring it close to the material, you feel a force. That force is supposedly the Casimir force. 
But if you talk to an atomic force macroscopist about what they're thinking, they're not thinking about what's not there. They're thinking about what is there. They're thinking about the interactions that take place atomically between the at atoms in the tip of the FM, atomic force microscope, and the surface of the uh, surface of the material itself. And if one really thinks into what one's thinking about, one's thinking about featureless metal plates. And you can extend that as well. You can say, okay, well, quantum field theory, yes, okay, we can think about featureable, me uh, featureless metal plates. And in fact, we should really go down to thinking about the elementary particles, the electron. So you get down to an electron, which is a spherical thing. So uh, in quantum electrodynamics, the electron is kind of a featureless spherical conducting ball. It's a featureless ball, perfectly smooth, very small, maybe ten point a point thing even, something which has no defined size, which is point-like. And uh, yeah, well, that's a very fine thing. And quantum dynamics I've used as well, myself, in anger, in my professional life at CERN. Um, we were using quantum dynamics to calculate the radiative corrections, for example, on elementary particles, the idea being there that, um, that there should be corrections because at the very small scale, an electron should be able, or any charged particle should be able to emit a photon and then reabsorb it. And there are a set of things called Feynman diagrams which allow you to calculate these things, and you can calculate them very well in quantum electrodynamics, thinking about featureless charged balls emitting and absorbing photons. Fine. That's all very good, and it's a very good theory for doing that. But there is a problem if one wants to do engineering, atomic force microscopy, or thinking about the way materials fit together at the quantum level. One then is very much better off not thinking about the space between having the quantum states, but thinking about the quantum states in the two materials, mutually interacting with one another and overlapping. And one then gets exactly the same set of quantum states that one does in the featureless metal plates model, but one gets them arising now from the material properties, from the electrons and the wave functions in the material, which overlap with one another. And once again, one gets an attractive force because as they overlap, they share the the field, if you like, between those two things. So you only need half the field to get the same field for each particle, and that's an attractive, weak force with exactly the same set of quantum states as you would calculate if you used a featureless metal plate. But now it's not featureless, now it's the electrons in the material that you're thinking about, the conduction system within the material itself. This is far finer, it is far more subtle, it is far deeper, and it needs to be realized that just because you find an attraction between two objects, that doesn't mean that one has proven that the vacuum fluctuations are real. And another thing, if one thinks in terms of models of elementary particles or sheets approaching one another in a vacuum as featureless sheets and featureless balls, then if one's thinking is restricted to only featureless balls, then one's thinking will be only about featureless balls.